Good morning, Dominic. Oh, hello there. How are you doing today? I'm very well, mate. How are you? I'm pretty good. My day's just starting, so nothing bad's happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to Cyber Talk today. I really do appreciate it. Um, I know it's really early in the morning for you, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm sure you're probably awake because you've got a little one as well, right? Uh, yes. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. Nor normally, I'm up at five, and I'm I'm a little nervous because he's not up yet. So um, I'm hoping we can get through this without him waking up. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I suppose with the way the world is at the moment, working from home is is, is a is is a new challenge, and uh, having a little one is probably even more of a challenge, uh, interrupting your day, but uh, can be quite amusing at times, right? I I I, I, I used to find it, um, you know, uh, I guess it's somewhat embarrassing because I, I I do work from home, home quite a bit, but but now I just, I find it comical and enjoying, and, and and people seem to like it when when he interrupts a Zoom call or my my pet cat or dog interrupts it. So now we just roll roll with the flow. My, we might be a viral sensation one day on YouTube. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So, so Dominic, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us today. It'd be really good for our audience if you could just share a little bit about yourself and sort of your your background uh, and kind of the stuff you're sort of focused in doing at the moment. Um, I think it'd be really good. Absolutely. So uh, uh, I'm based in Vancouver, British Columbia. So it is 7 a.m. <laughs> uh, uh, where I am. Uh, I'm very fortunate, which I've been able to be in cybersecurity my entire professional career. And I like to tell people there was sort of two, two versions of me. There was my uh, corporate career, which was the first 10 years of my career. Uh, most of that time was focused in the credit union system, uh, where I was in charge of cybersecurity at, at a large credit union here. Um, but about five years ago, I had an awakening of sorts and realized that I uh, wanted to leave corporate. And I guess corporate wasn't really meant for my uh, um, ego, I guess, mentality. I'm not really sure how to, how to characterize that. But uh, uh, past five years, I've been working on uh, building Cyber SC, which is, uh, I mean, originally it served as a tax shelter, but now it's actually profitable, <laughs> which, is, which is great. And it serves as being uh, an advisory firm for small and mid-sized organizations. Um, you know, the, the marketing term is is VC. So, but I, I like to say that we provide cyber risk leadership uh, to uh, small and mid sized organizations uh, throughout North America. And so, so, so cyber SC was that um, sort of an entrepreneurial pool, um, sort of direction that you took. Um, sort of, you know, I spent a bit of my you know career in large corporates as well, now doing very different things. Um, so, so do you find sort of that mindset is a bit more innovative? Uh, a, a, a allows you to you know, experiment with different ways of working and, 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 and um, is, is a much more relaxed environment to work in. Absolutely, you know, and, and you know, I, I, what I like, and it's funny, I often joke with, joke with my wife, I say, you know what, it's, it's great working for myself because now the only idiot telling me to do something is this idiot. So you know, I, 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 I enjoy that, the, uh, that freedom. And to your point there, you know, when you're not, and not to say that corporate can't be innovative, but uh, I love the uh, uh, freedom to be able to make mistakes in which, again, if, if something does go wrong, it, it's okay. You know, I, I, I can learn from that quickly. I don't feel the need to try to prove something to myself. Um, it, it gives me sort of that flexibility to be creative and, and to fail often and fail quickly, but to, to learn great things from those failures. Whereas in, in corporates, you know, failure is deemed as a bad thing rather than yes. uh, a lesson learned, right? Um, you know, you can, you can, if you fail multiple times in a, in a large corporate, especially with cybersecurity, you're likely to be shown the door rather than given the opportunity to fix something, which is, which is a real shame. It, 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 exactly. Or you feel the need to justify why it failed and, uh, you know, how's it going to be different next time? And again, it, it, it's different pressures. And uh, uh, again, I find it very liberating uh, working um, um you know, as an entrepreneur uh, and not having to, like I said, be in a rigid corporate structure, which uh, again, it, it works for some people, but, but, but for me, and it was, it was odd. I always thought I was someone who wanted to work in corporate for, for life. And uh, I never viewed myself as an entrepreneur, but uh, through that 10 year career and over the past five years of self-discovery, I realized how, how much I love being an entrepreneur. But I think one thing that the, the, the sort of having a grounding in, in a, a corporate environment, it does give you some really excellent skill sets, um, and I think you can take that and 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 utilize that in a in a business that you want to set up. So I think there's pros and cons to doing it, especially in the, the cyberspace. Oh, um, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And you know, I, I I I tell people too when when they're 
uh, a lot of young people that I mentor, they say, well, we want to be a consultant, you know, and, and I was like, well, great, but you, you, in my mind, you shouldn't do that uh, as soon as you enter industry. You know, I, I as much as I uh, crap on my time <laughs> in, the, in, 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 in corporate, it was, it was necessary. I wouldn't be the advisor that I am today if I didn't have that um, uh, corporate experience behind me. It, it, it is a, uh, it was very much a necessity and very much formed uh, sort of my viewpoints and how I view security, I mean, good and bad, <laughs> uh, uh, today. So, you know, it, it's it's definitely um, something which uh, I encourage people to not just jump to jump into consulting um, right out of school. Um, that's you're, you're doing yourself and your clients a disservice that way. So, so, so touching on the stuff that uh, Cyber SC does, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we, we briefly spoke about is, you um, um, you know, supporting small businesses, uh, and especially in a very trying time that sort of the economy is going. Uh, how are you finding um, your interaction A with your with your with your clients now? Uh, and B, has that created opportunity, or are you seeing it decrease? Uh, how, how has it affected you from a, from a business standpoint? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. You know, the the um, one of the consistent themes I've been hearing from a lot of smaller organizations, and at, at the end of the day, it's the smaller mid-sized organizations that are very much uh, um, wearing the brunt of the uh, economic impact from, uh, from a business perspective. And many of them are telling us, you know, we're in quote unquote survival mode. You know, we're just trying to cut costs, focus on bare minimum. And that's okay. Totally agree with that. But uh, sort of where the dialogue is really struggling is when people, uh, organizations tell us that they'll deal with cybersecurity down the road. You know, um, we've heard that multiple times over the past uh, seven weeks or so. Uh, you know, once things get better, then we'll we'll, we'll, we'll reconsider how you know uh, how we're approaching cybersecurity. And, and I like to tell these people that you know what, that's okay that you're in survival mode. But in this day and age, every organization, unless you're selling tacos out of the back of your mom's Volvo, is a digital organization, and you have you have to have to consider cyber risk as part of that. And even if you're just doing the basics, like basic cyber hygiene, that's still part of, you know, the, the um, survival mode. So um, there's been a lot of disconnect, I would say, uh, with uh, how organizations view survival mode and the fact that they view cybersecurity sort of as a luxury of sorts that they can just deal with on, on a sunny day. So I think there's a, a, a um, an issue with a lot of organizations, whether you're large or small. We, as you said, we've heard this a lot about we'll, we'll kick sort of cybersecurity down the, the, the can, you know, something we can address at a, at a later stage. Um, but in order to, 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 to get out of this, um, you know, current crisis, if everyone is sticking in, I'm in sort of disaster recovery resiliency mode and I have to recover what I think is critical. How do we get over that, that hurdle of trying to educate people that it is a, it's a primer, you need to do this as part and parcel of your, your business operations. It's not something that sits on the, periphery yeah you know and, and, uh, you know it, it's been interesting have, having that 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 dialogue you know and, and uh, i think really what it comes down to what one of the core concepts we've been trying to communicate to or uh, to people and to organizations is this concept of uh, digital trust uh, and really understanding that you know at this at this time and at this juncture uh making sure that you're preserving the trust that your your clients your customers uh your employees have have in your organization uh, core to that digital trust is the need to be able to 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 do cybersecurity and include cybersecurity measures as as part of um, um, those those measures and um, really helping these organizations. So again, trying to really break down from a technical perspective. Uh, I think one of the main barriers, uh, at least what I'm seeing with small and mid-sized organizations, is that pervasive thought that they still see cybersecurity as being a, a function of IT. And uh, IT, you know, can be dealt um, can be dealt with down the road. You know, as long as long as things are running, you know, sort of the keeping the lights on, cybersecurity is seen as a as more of a project or a function of IT. So I think that's where we're we're having the I would say the biggest wins in terms of dialogue is really helping them understand that we're talking about business risk. This isn't just some IT functionality that we're trying to to switch on. So are you seeing a shift in the way that um, small and medium sized businesses? Uh, especially when it comes to that specific issue around cyber being an IT problem, are they now, you know, not not reaching out to these mid-tier IT firms? So it happens a lot in the UK, and I'm sure it does globally. Um, so if you've got an organisation, you know, 250 plus, um, they'll go out and um, get cybersecurity advice from their IT provider, yeah. um, and they're not necessarily qualified to give that yeah. advice. 
uh, they don't have the expertise to give that advice. So, you know, uh, and the same, you know, the, the analogy that I use, you know, if you're, if you're ill, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go to KPMG, you'd go to see a GP, right? You know, uh, so the, the, the idea is slowly shifting. Are you seeing that with the people that you're dealing with now, that there is a, as a better understanding of that division of labor and understanding of the expertise involved in, in, in cybersecurity? Yeah, and you, know, you bring up a really interesting point there. You know, and again, there's, I'd say, for me, there's still so many prevailing myths that happen with small and mid-sized organizations as it pertains to cybersecurity. Like one of those prevailing myths that, that you mentioned there is uh, again that focus on an IT managed service provider. Um, we even pre-COVID, you know, uh, if we're talking to an organization about cyber risk or cybersecurity, like, well, you know, our, our IT MSP handles that. We're, we're, we basically washed our hands of it, and if we get breached, it's it's on them. You know, that, that type of mentality. And um, again, there's that disconnect and that assumption that cybersecurity is purely a technical function and it's something that can be fully outsourced. Uh, and, and almost lumping it with the well, if it's Desktop support, cybersecurity, it's all, it's all the same thing kind of thing to, to many non-technical uh, business executives in, in, in the SMB uh, arena. So I think where we've, again, really tried to focus on is just breaking myths and breaking, um, sort of re-educating uh, the, the small mid-sized business community and understanding that at the end of the day, we're talking about risk and risk management. This isn't IT. IT is certainly part of the implementation uh, pieces of it from an operational perspective, but at the end of the day, we're talking about risk management. And um, so there's still, I think, as much as much gains as I've seen in the, in the past five years in terms of education among uh, uh, small and mid-sized business executives, uh, there's still a lot of ground to be gained in terms of uh, breaking a lot of uh, old school myths. So one of the things that your organization does, I believe, is uh, provide a, um, a free tool to help small organizations or small medium-sized organizations get a under better understanding of Sort of what their security posture is. Do you, do you mind just sharing what 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 that is? Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, it, 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 I mean, it's a constant work in progress. But one one of the uh, uh, freebies that, that that we offer uh, uh, organizations uh, there's a 16 question uh, questionnaire <laughs> on, <laughs> on our website on, on cyber.se, and uh, it, it, it's again, very very high level, and it's meant to just really zero in on um, what we feel are very the most critical of the critical uh, security controls or security aspects that every organization uh, uh, should have. Um, and as part of that, they'll get uh, a very high level assessment report and be able to help them identify the areas, the top three or four areas where they can focus on in terms of being able to continually mature their, their cybersecurity. You know, and um, you know, one of the reasons why we lo love giving that out for free is that we know in the small and mid-sized business community that um, budgets are, are tight, you know, resources are, are, are tight so uh for us if we can do what we want to be able to do is make sure that we can at least do what we can to help rise the tide just a little bit you know if we can make uh, sort of that collective baseline for all small mid-sized businesses when it comes to cybersecurity, just a little bit sharper just a little bit uh, tougher um then we're making it tougher on on the cyber criminals to to see uh small mid-sized businesses as low-hanging fruit and and that's available on your website is it people can register that's, and download that's, it that's, Yep, yep. No, it's it's all interactive on, on the website. Basically, just uh, you know, uh, uh, it should take take five minutes uh, of your time. And like I said, there, uh, it, it's a really good, quick uh, synopsis and gives at least some high level actionable items for some small and mid sized uh, organizations in terms of where they should they could focus their uh, uh, their efforts when it comes to cybersecurity. And and that's available to everyone globally, I assume. Right? Yep, abso absolutely. Okay. Unless you're in the Arctic, I'm not sure if I can properly help, <laughs> help people out there, but <laughs> pretty much global. <laughs> so one of one of the things I think you mentioned and it's really important is around uh, cyber criminality and 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 obviously small and medium sized businesses are a great target for opportunistic, uh, you know, cyber criminals. You know, what kind of advice would you be giving small and medium sized businesses that wanted to protect themselves against, you know, um, you know, very basic advice around protecting themselves against. Uh, um, you know, uh, that kind of threat. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I often start with, uh, with that narrative is, is uh, asking, you know, small mid midsize uh, business owners and executives, I would say, you know, what type of organization, what size of organization has the most to lose when it comes to cybercrime or to a data breach? Uh, you know, is it a small organization or a large organization or enterprise organization? And pretty much 99% of the time, they, they'll say, well, it's the enterprise. It's a large organization. They have the most to lose. 
And uh, I, I tell them, no, I, actually, they don't. You know, yes, we may hear in the mass media that you know, all these big organizations get, get hit and get compromised, but they, they have the war chest to survive. You know, if, you, if you look over the past 20 years of all the large organizations that were hit by some sort of cyber crime or data breach, um, you know, they, they, they pulled through. You know, very few, if, if any, uh, uh, went bankrupt or, or, or went under. Um, where, it's an, where cyber crime is an existential threat, is to small and mid-sized organizations. They're the ones that you don't hear about when they get hit by a data breach or get hit by massive ransomware uh, and end up going bankrupt or end up going under. Um, for the small and mid-sized businesses, uh, cybercrime is an existential threat. And that's what I like to tell people is that that's the strange paradox that so many people think it's the large organizations that have the most to lose. Um, you know, Technically, they'll, they could lose a lot of money but it's it's not a, 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 an issue of their uh, their existence. It's very much an existential threat for small and mid-sized businesses. I think that's the key point that I like to get across to people. Well, a large organizations will have the luxury of having large budgets to be able yes. to in technology and people and have you know complex processes to help them protect against um, such activity. Whereas the small sort of the SMB is not going to necessarily be in that position. Um, but sorry, go on. No, no, I was, I was, I, was I, I, I completely agree with you there, Naveen. Though, and and, and that's what's uh, often uh, lost on on these small and mid-sized organizations. Again, back to some of those myths. Um, you know, uh, it, it still troubles me that even in this day and age, I still hear the well, we're, we're too small, small to be a target. You know, why would a cyber criminal come after us? You know, we don't have anything valuable. You know, th that was thinking I heard 20, 15 years ago when I entered the the field, and I, I still hear that now. It's still a very prevalent level of thought among small and mid-sized businesses. Um, you know, it, it's it's very. Um, Sad in many ways. You know, after 15 years, you know, we still haven't been able to minimize that narrative. You know, it's 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 not. I'm not sure if it's necessarily a a majority percentage of small and mid-sized businesses that, that still think that, but it's still a very sizable percentage, uh, and that's troubling. So that's why, like I said, you know, being able to leverage platforms like this and being able to educate as many the non-technical people as possible to really help them understand that cyber risk in this day and age, this is 2020, we're not living in 1995 anymore, affects every single organization. Well, it's been 20 years since the I love you virus, right? You yes. Know, <laughs> the estimated profit that was around 10 billion. Uh, and and the, the the funny thing about the I love you virus is that actually we're still falling for the same very simple tricks that uh, are being played. That 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 they're okay. They're much more technically sophisticated, but fundamentally the the, the same to cause either disruption or to have some sort of financial gain, um, which is which is quite interesting. So just touching on the points around risk, uh, which I find really interesting. Um, so so. You know, having having dealing or your dealings with these small businesses, what's your perception on sort of the consistent risks that you're having to explain to businesses that are similar in nature across the board? Yeah, you know, I, I think when we're, when we're when we're talking about um, sort of consistent risks, um, you know, uh, there's a couple uh, a common threads. You know, I, I think the first uh, risk to me is that. Um, what we've been talking about is, is that false sense of security uh, in which uh, cyber security or cyber risk isn't up to the uh, executive team that they can just outsource that or they can just buy cyber insurance and they, they'll be good. Um, for many of the organizations where we go into, uh, I often refer to as the false sense of security as being the biggest risk. Uh, it's not an external threat. It's not an external risk. It's very much something that's, that's internal. And if you're operating under a false sense of security, um, you're not going to be making optimum decisions uh, uh, when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, so to me, that's very much a, a consistent risk that I see across uh, many, many small and mid-sized organizations. And that tends to cut across uh, most sectors as well. Um, you know, uh, maybe in some regu more regulated spaces uh, like financial services or healthcare, um, that level of, of thinking is less prevalent. Um, but it's still, you know, like quite, quite widespread that to have that level of uh, uh, a false sense of security. And um, what are you finding um, in, in terms of providing risk mitigation and advice and counsel back to these organizations? Where is there truly an understanding of what that impact is, or does it get brushed over sometimes, as we were previously saying, actually, this is an IT problem, I can't solve this? So, how do you get over that hurdle A and, and, and B, where do you land then in terms of that mitigation activity? 
Yeah, you know, I, I, I think really what it, where it comes down to, again, is just having constructive dialogue and really not coming from a technical place. You know, uh, often when we have these conversations, uh, we sort of dig deep uh, and when we're, we're talking about the relationship that they have with their IT service provider, um, we'll find out that it's basically uh, based on blind trust. They'll say, well, we never understand what the heck our IT, you know, our IT guy or our IT managed service provider is is telling us and and you know, we'll, we're we just agreeing with them because the, the words that they're saying seem seem to be uh you know big and we don't understand what they're talking about we don't want to appear to be weak or foolish in front of our service provider uh so you know there's, there's a there's a lot of unfortunate you know ego <laughs> that, that's uh-huh. getting, getting in the way of making sure that everyone is on the same is on the same page and you know, often when we talk with a lot of it service providers uh um, you know we'll, we'll hear from them that they'll say well uh, we don't want to upend the Apple cart. You know, a lot, a lot of our a lot of our clients are just happy if we tell them that things are secure, uh, that that's good enough for them. So that we're going to just keep doing that. Uh, so you know, on both sides, there's culpability, right? You have both sides not willing to have good, clear, open dialogue, and good, clear communication uh, across uh, across the table. And again. It sounds somewhat cliche, but you know, you, you got to speak the same language. You know, it's fine because the IT service providers don't want to speak the business language because they're they're worried that the uh, uh, their clients may not like what they have to say. Uh, and the on the client side, or you know, the executives of small and mid-sized businesses, they don't want to uh, really uh, appear to be weak or uh, asking questions uh, because they they feel again there's a there's a power struggle there, and, and they want to feel like they're in, in control of that relationship. So it's. Uh, to me, when we're talking about root cause, it's it's lack of communication. Yeah, and also it sounds like two teenagers dating. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, br- that brings me back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, I think you raised a really important point there around uh, service providers. So managing your service providers is one thing. It's 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 definitely one hundred percent, and I agree with you totally uh, about communication. But fundamentally, it's about contractual mm-hmm. obligation. And um, ensuring that um, if that service provider is providing you with assurance over your security, that you've uh, articulated and documented contractually what that service provision is. Because if you're failing to do that, they, they can tell you they're secure based upon, hey, this is what we said in the contract. And according to that, we're fine. So how are you, are you ever having to deal with challenges where you then become the interface effectively to the service provider, the business? You know the the, the back end guys, the third parties, the fourth parties that they can extend quite significantly, right? Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and that's very much how, how we position ourselves as being true uh, trusted advisors and uh, you know a bridge or a conduit, uh, so you know everyone can be on the right page. And whether we need to communicate to the IT service provider, the internal IT team, to the to the executives, you know, at the, you know uh, a lot of a lot of secure professionals know that at the end of the day, one of their best skill sets is to be a great communicator and great translator in which no matter who the audience is, we're able to, to bridge all that and, and, and be that ultimate connector. So often that's the role that we play with, with many of our clients and uh, like I said, in that trusted advisor status, which our, our main, our, our main stakeholder is, is you know, a CEO, business owner, CFO, VP of operations, what have you, but we are serving as that main communicator, main connect, uh, main uh, communicator, main connector with the rest of the, um, uh, with the rest of the security function, whether that be an outsourced IT service provider, whether that be an internal IT guy, again, depending on how small the business is, you know, someone's brother-in-law, uh, you know, so it, it allows us, like I said, to, to really be that, that main communi- uh, to bridge that communication gap. Uh, and that, that ends up being, a, like, like I said, the, the main hurdle that, that needs to be cleared. That's excellent. So, so one of one of one of the other challenges I think that um, small and medium sized businesses have is access to um, technology. Uh, technology around cybersecurity can be extremely expensive if if not managed correctly. Um, uh, but there are a lot of challenges now around technology services. So, how how do you partner with local technology providers and or international technology providers to help provide technical solutions as well as the advisory bit, or is that done by somebody else? Yeah, you know, the, 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 one of the things that you know, is core to how we've grown our, our business is through strategic partnerships. Um, and again, what I always like to do is, is to make sure that the advice that we give is truly unbiased. Uh, one of the things which uh, very much jaded me early in my career was that when we would bring in a security consultant, uh, before truly understanding what our problems were, 
uh, they would say, oh, you know what, you need to just buy Solution X. That'll solve all your problems. I buy some pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then when, when I would look look more into that relationship, I would find out that they were like a, a platinum spot, you know, they're pl a platinum partner with, with a company X. And, you know, if they sold that, they would get 20%. 20%. I was like, well, you're, you're being biased in your advice then. So, um, you know, for, from, from our point of view, we again serve as being connectors, and so uh, again, depending on our client, you know, sometimes they will have an existing relationship with a technology provider, and we'll we'll do our best to focus again on what capabilities need to be delivered, not so much the technical solution. A lot of technical solutions are a dime a dozen, but it comes down to what capabilities do you need, and, and what solutions are out there that best map to those requirements. So, uh, when needed, there are obviously strategic partners that 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 we we bring in and uh, to have those conversations and maybe the service implementers uh, again, that that's completely uh, a separate relationship. Uh, I'm someone who hates middle, you know, someone who serves as, as a middleman and people who take middleman fees. Um, there's too much of that right now in society. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think generally that's the way that the market works, right? Someone stuck in the middle servicing both ends of the equation. Yeah. Um, that, that's great. So, so in, in t one of the other things I see, especially with, small businesses so small businesses are very interconnected to each other <clears throat> and so it creates its own sort of macro uh, supply chain um and obviously there are significant risks with 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 um supply chains as a whole you know um having worked in both sides of the corporate and the small business you can see the potential in impact it can have is one part of that supply chain is corrupted so how do you think that small, you know what advice would you give to small businesses that are extremely interconnected and interdependent on on other businesses to be able to operate you know what advice would you be giving that small business from a security standpoint to, to best protect itself absolutely and again you know I, I... The supply chain risk and and, uh, and the whole notion of vendor risk management is is incredibly important, especially with with B two B organizations, and anecdotally, what we've seen with a lot uh, many prospects and, and many of our clients as well uh, is that there's the uh, I would say an ongoing maturity in terms of how enterprises and larger organizations are really clamping down uh, and evolving beyond just some, some of those simple <laughs> questions uh, or that's uh, simple security questionnaires when it comes to doing their due diligence. And mm -hmm. in many cases, organizations are being asked to provide actionable proof uh, of a real cybersecurity program. <laughs> and you know, we've, we've had this happen more than once uh, where a prospect will reach out to us and, and say, well, we, we've been you know, we've been quote unquote, you know, lying or extending the truth on our security questionnaires the past few years because no one's really checking on them, and now they're asking for proof. Uh, you know, this this contract represents uh, a majority of our revenue. If we lose this contract, our company could go under. Uh, so you know, th th there's a very clear business reason why organizations and small mid sized businesses in particular need to be able to uh, invest in a, a, a cybersecurity program and to be able to demonstrate that you're taking a measured approach and risk-based approach uh, uh, um, to that. And uh, again, not just with upstream to, you know, to, to large organizations that, that, that rely on you, but uh, like you were pointing out there, other organizations that are uh, maybe downstream uh, uh, from you or vendors that you rely on as, a, as an organization, that's an extension of your cyber risk. Uh, so you need to make sure that you're doing sufficient due diligence there as well, because at the end of the day, especially like I said for B2B organizations, if the big fish, the big large organizations that you sell your services, your platform to, uh, uh, are clamping down on that, and something happens, um, yeah, you know, there's there's very very much like a contractual uh, obligations that are contractual clauses in which you could lose uh, that contract, could lose that business. So there's very clear business reasons, it's not just worrying about some, you know, quote unquote, cyber hacker, cyber attacker, there's very clear business reasons why you need to invest in cybersecurity. And and actually the knock on effect for the for the, the small party is potentially uh, very litigious, you could end up in, in, in court and litigation. Absolutely. And it could be bye bye business as a result, right? So <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Um, so, so um, as a sort of staying in, the, in in that space around um, um, sort of extending that sort of third party risk uh, element, um, you know, there have been a lots of advances in in uh, third party risk um, uh, assessments, and actually, uh, you know, just sort of touching on assessments in general. Um, there's a trap that that uh, some small businesses um, assume that by going down the route of getting ISO accreditation or getting a third party to accredit you in some particular ways is, is, a, is a great standing, you know, uh, and a potential 
um, business attractor. You know, what advice would you give to those small businesses? Because I don't necessarily, for me personally, I don't necessarily going down that route is the right route. So in the UK, we have something called Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus, you know, which is a government driven scheme that can provide assurance over your, you know, cyber requirements. Is there something similar in Canada that, that, that does that, that allows a sort of cheaper version of that focus? but also gives them some sense of accreditation at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 there's a, a clean government has released something similar in some I'm trying to the exact acronym, but basically it's a, a clean essentials <laughs> when it comes yeah. to cybersecurity for small uh, mid-sized businesses. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of the CIS top 20. Uh, I think that's a great universal framework. Um, and, and one of the things that I, I'd like to tell uh, our clients and people that, you know, when people ask us about, you know, what is the right framework? Uh, I like to say, you know, what, 80% of the, I'm uh, sorry, if you look at all those frameworks, uh, they're pretty much all pretty much the same. There may be, you know, a, a slight nuance or uh, difference here and there, but for the most part, uh, I just say, just pick a damn framework and work with that and be able to demonstrate, uh, be able to prove that uh, you're achieving uh, um, uh, that framework and that you're able to, to meet the requirements in that at, and tailor fit it based on your, your risk profile and risk tolerance for your organization, uh, rather than just focusing on what's the best uh, framework to use, uh, just start somewhere small, uh, start somewhere simple, and then just continually mature and continually improve. Um, at the end of the day, security is a journey. So you just got to start somewhere and just keep maturing year over year. So so we're, we're, we're midway through sort of 2020 uh, uh, in May. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, pretty complex times for a lot of people um, who are having to isolate countries that are shut down, uh, a lot of small businesses going out of business as a result. You know, what do you see? Um, uh, and I suppose let's let's try to to hone in on some of the positive things here. But what do you see as sort of the uh, uh, the key positives in this space um, um, uh, over the next sort of few months? But also, what would you see as sort of the key uh, challenges? Ah, I think we've got a few technical problems at the moment, uh, uh, and um, uh, we have lost our special guest, uh, so please bear with us for a second while we try to fix that. Um, so just touching on that point, actually, uh, uh, while we wait, um, um, so so for, for, for a lot of us, I think there is a, um, uh, a sense of uncertainty within the marketplace. Uh, there's a sense of um, fear about where we're gonna where we're gonna land. I think it's really important to to actually uh, focus on um, some of the opportunities that have arisen as a result of our current situation. Uh, uh, number one, I think it's it's quite um, astonishing how quickly a lot of organisations have. Uh, ah, I think we've got Dominic back. Yes, we have. Ah, <laughs> have made an appearance, Dominic. Yes, this is this is James. So, uh, um, pardon the uh, brief interruption there. That that's was right, uh, that's right, I, 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 heard, I heard him screaming upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Well, listen, we we won't keep you too long. I think my my, my very last question then to you is, you know, what do you, what do you see as um, some of the key uh, um, you know opportunities, I suppose, for small and large businesses when it comes to cybersecurity, and probably what what are the three sort of challenges that we're going to see in the next few months over 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 this and, and cyber security and, and when we get out of lockdown and for the back to some sense of normality yeah i i think what's really important uh um uh, naveen there first again small miss has organizations to really clue in on is that especially during this time uh and I, we, we, we've we've seen indicators of this, and I've, you know, uh, um, again, I totally see this with with uh, clients as well, and then other professionals I'm talking to is that cyber criminals are doubling down, tripling down <laughs> on cyber crimes right now. You know, there's more people working from home, uh, people are distracted. Uh, case in point here with uh, <laughs> James, oh, you know, uh, pe 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 people having to to do multiple things. Uh, so we're seeing increase in uh, uh, malware attacks, phishing schemes. Uh, you know, th they're seeing this as that opportunity because truly everyone is, is hyper distracted right now. Um, and so, and what I like to tell organizations and tell people is that at the end of the day, cyber criminals are professionals. You know, this isn't 1995 where, again, we're, we're dealing with script kiddies or 16 year old hackers. We're dealing with professionals. And as such, organizations, big and small, 
can no yeah. longer afford to take an amateurish approach to cybersecurity. You need to take a professional approach. If you're going up against professionals, uh, you can't be an amateur in your response. That's like uh, a professional soccer squad going up against a, a group of 11 year olds. You know, who's going to win that, that one, right? It's like bringing again a proverbial spoon to a gunfight. So organizations need to realize at the other end of the table is a professional. Uh, and as such, you need to take a professional approach, especially during this time right now. And of, uh, like I said, we're just seeing increased cyber attacks and uh, phishing uh, uh, attempts right, 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 uh, right through the roof. So we need to t uh, step our collective game up. Great. I mean, that's that's great advice. Um, okay. So, so listen. Thank you again. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak. Thank to you. Us. And uh, um, uh, just in case anyone wants to get in touch with you or, or uh, connect with you, they can connect via LinkedIn. It's probably the best approach. If anyone has any questions, please. I love it when people reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's often the highlight of my uh, uh, of my day, uh, and that's what I do when he's taking his afternoon nap. I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. So please, anyone who liked what I had to say, or even if you didn't like what I had to say, please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Always appreciate that. Perfect. And they can connect through uh, cyber.sc as well. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and I would encourage everyone that's that's watching to take a look at um, the free tooling that they have, which is which is really good. So, thank you very much again. Um, I hope you and your family stay safe uh, and get out of lockdown in one piece. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and yeah, really appreciate it. So, thank you very much, Dominic. Uh, it's been a great conversation. You as well, Naveen. Thank you again so much. Cheers. Thank Thanks. And to the audience, thank you very much. Uh, hope you all have a, a great bank holiday weekend if you're in the UK or an extended weekend. Uh, and join us again in a couple of weeks where we'll be talking to somebody else. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye.